Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is David. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm coming from St. Thomas University as a university in Miami, uh, South Florida. Uh, I would like to present today about uh, a work that was done along with two of my students. I have them here sitting. Uh, and the motivation for, that for this presentation was a class that we uh, taught uh, last spring about graph theory and networks. It's part of the major of mathematics. And we were thinking about what sort of project can we give to students to do uh, a course project at the end of the semester. Uh, so we divided the class in, in different teams. And one of the teams in that class was dedicated to the use of graph theory in biomedical applications. Uh, one of the applications that we used it uh, was uh, the application to brain networks. And, oh, oh, sorry, I don't know what's going on here with the. One of the applications uh, we found interesting was the application to uh, brain science using uh, graph theory. Uh, so that's the reason why I will divide my uh, talk pretty much into what's the subject of the analysis, which is epilepsy, and then what are the techniques that allow you to get information from and how to use a graph theory, and in that context, how you can implement that with using Mathematica. Okay, so epilepsy in general is a, a condition, it's a neurological condition, which is characterized per, uh, by seizures that people experience. Sometimes those seizures might be mild, sometimes those seizures might be extremely dangerous to the point that people might just get completely uh, out of motion, out of, out of business. Uh, it's, uh, epilepsy is the fourth most common neurological condition in the United States. Uh, that's the reason why it's a lot of grant from the NIH uh, oriented to treat the, the problem or deal with the problem of epilepsy. But from the medical point of view, uh, epilepsy is a big challenge for medical doctors for two reasons. There's some epileptic seizures that might be treated with medications and patients can manage the condition. But there are some epileptic seizures that cannot be treated with medication and patients have to uh, be exposed to surgical procedures. Then when surgeons have to do the surgical procedures, the percentage of uh, success on those surgical procedures are pretty low. Why? Because they don't, uh, it's usually is a, uh, a board of doctors sitting together and they try to guess what the best uh, strategy to remove pieces of the brain to, uh, to try to keep the epilepsy under control. Sometimes they're lucky and they might make that and patients are recovering pretty well. Sometimes the returning of the epilepsy to the patient is becoming even worse than the before the procedure. So that's the reason why graph theory now is trying to help in that direction, trying to figure it out what are the functional networks involved during the epileptic seizures and, and giving a guidance to the medical doctors when they have to do uh, surgical procedures, what part of the brain should be eliminated in order to minimize uh, the invasive procedure that that involves. Okay. Uh, which are the two techniques from where we're getting, uh, let's say, experimental values? Okay, one is uh, electroencephalograms. So you got the time series of electroencephalograms, uh, and you compare electroencephalograms from the resting state uh, with those that you have during seizures. So then you have a reference normal electroencephalogram. And then you have what you call the partial seizures, patients that have epilepsy, ep showing epilepsy with a mild component. And then you have epileptic patients that are extremely uh, chronic, that are showing a very, or as I'm showing here, uh, are showing a, a very chaotic uh, signal uh, in those cases. And that's why you call your generalized seizures, uh, because then the epileptic wave spread out over the entire brain. It's not very localized, it's spreading out over the entire brain. So typically, uh, what's the procedure that people follow? You have the electroencephalogram that has a pretty good temporal resolution, and you complement the electroencephalogram with uh, functional MRI. 
The reason why people choose functional MRI because functional MRI is oriented toward uh, the oxygen content of the blood. And then uh, the oxygen content of the blood is an indication, it's a proxy indication of the brain activity. So uh, functional MRI has a pretty good spatial resolution in contrast to electroencephalogram that has a pretty good temporal resolution. So if you want to get the best of both worlds, people try to combine electroencephalogram to get a pretty good temporal resolution with the fMRI to get a pretty good spatial resolution. So once you have that, with that kind of resolution, the, the, the question is, what kind of information can we get out of this? Okay, typically uh, the patients are getting together the electroencephalogram and the fMRI, and then you, you try to construct what you call uh, the connection or the connectivity matrix, how it's done. Okay, this is a kind of tricky moment. Tricky, okay. I... Uh, because uh, you need to elaborate on a strategy to uh, consider which pieces of the brain are more connected than others. So then you are using what you call the covariance matrix. So you look for the correlation coefficient. But now when you use the, co the correlation coefficient, the person correlation coefficient typically, covariance matrix, you need to set a, a threshold value for strong correlation that are the point that you will include in your connection matrix. Typically the connection matrix is done based on correlation values uh, higher than uh, 0.55. So it's just strong correlation, the one that you keep. Uh, then low correlation, typically you are putting that in the background and you're not considering then in the first round of your analysis. So now you got the connection matrix, you might convert that connection matrix to the adjacency matrix, which is the one that you use to control the network. And that network could be of two types either an anatomical network, which usually we're getting from the functional MRI, or you can have a functional network that means not all the nodes you have in the anatomical network are participating in the functional network. So, and then you have to make that differentiation. That's the approach that we call top-bottom approach. You get the information from patients, and then you will contract all the anatomical things. In our case, we decided to adopt a bottom-top approach. So we're using mobile networks, and we will try to figure it out how the topology of the network is influencing the synchronization of the neuronal oscillator or the neuronal network in general. In doing this, we divided the, the modeling part in two pieces. A microscopic modeling, when you have neuron-neuron interaction, and for neuron-neuron interaction, we use uh, the Fitch-Hughes-Nagumo model, which is pretty common in, in neuroscience. And then for modeling different patches of the cortical area of the brain, where too many neurons are participating simultaneously, we're using the Kuramoto model, which is a pretty typical uh, model in mathematics for tuning and synchronization. And people who are familiar with this Estrogat uh, book, on dynamical, dynamical system and chaos, that's one of the models that he analyzed a lot. So we're following the bottom top approach and doing that, so what's the step of the modeling that we decided to do? So okay, we're creating an, a model network. Uh, we look to topological indices of that network and then based on the connectivity matrix and the weight of connections, uh, we're passing that to the system of differential equations and, and then we compute the solution and the synchronization processes uh, that you have there. Okay, uh, the mathematic, mathematic implementation is based on generation of a random graph. Uh, we're using uh, sometimes the barabasi alba graph distribution, the watts graph distribution, the Bernoulli distribution, and some other random distribution that we created on our own. Okay, these are pretty much the network that we analyze it during that process of modeling. Okay, the first, uh, we started testing the situation with two neurons, and then we move it from two to 10 neurons, 11 neurons, 13 neurons, 64 neurons, and the largest system that we modeled, neuron-neuron interaction, was with 128 neurons involved, which is a pretty good number. 
uh, especially when you're looking for areas of the brain when you do the surgical procedures. As you can see, uh, some of the networks over there, they have bridge points. Uh, bridge points are pretty important because in graph theory, we know that Hamiltonian path, the Eulerian path, are pretty sensitive to the bridge point because you can make the graph disconnected and, and to disjoint a part of the graph will mean that the lack of synchronization between pieces of the brain. Okay, uh, so uh, the solution for the huge Nagumo model in a single neuron, which is the test one, is showing the limit cycle, uh, and that's the parameter, the phase plot for the solution, uh, making sure that we're working in the with the real model and we test it. Then we test it for the two neurons. You can see the, the solution for each one of the neurons. They're following the same uh, pattern. And then when you compute, in that case, the synchronization index for that neurons, you're going to see that the synchronization index will be pretty sensitive to the parameters of the equation that I showed before. Then we move it to the 10 neurons. When you go to the 10 neurons connected between themselves, so what happened? So you're going to see that some of the neurons are oscillating very fast, but then you have kind of a transient behavior where all the neurons start dying out. Uh, and the signal that you so the stimuli that you put in front outside, so they're going to die pretty quickly. So there's not sustained oscillation for the particular topology that we choose. Um, however, when you look at another topology like this one, OK, uh, what you can see there is that practically there is no oscillation at all. There's, there's some group of neurons, if they will be connected that, in that way, you're not going to see too much oscillation over there. So you're, you're not going to see the spread out of the stimuli over there. It's a kind of an in inhibition process over there. So now we, pro we tested with the 64 neuron configuration because we got from uh, neuron anatomy that there's some kind of bundle of neurons that they try to form dendrite uh, pattern, uh, what kind of bridge in the middle. And when you look at that type, type of topology, you will see uh, that the sustained oscillation will last for a long period of time, which means the, the, the brain areas are connected and are synchronized. And there's a more typical uh, anat anatomical uh, topology that you can see from uh, the brain configuration. Uh, so how we implemented that in Mathematica? So uh, basically, uh, we work with the adjacency matrix command that Mathematica has. We created with a ta uh, couple of tables to assign the weight to each one of the edges of a graph. Uh, we created a, a combined uh, matrix that is the multiplication for the adjacency matrix times the weight for that particular edge. And then we saw by the system of differential equation. In that case, it's 64 neurons, so it's going to be 64 uh, different equations. It fits huge Nagumo because you have two variables, u and b, so it's going to be pretty much 128 equations that you solve simultaneously. And on top of that, uh, if you add that the weight of the edge which means how strong might be the connection between neurons, can evolve over time. So you're going to add a third equation times 64. So that's the number of equations that you're solving simultaneously. The time of operation or the time of, uh, the time of solution, it takes in Mathematica 10.3, no more than two minutes to make the calculation. So if you do that optim in an optimized way, two minutes take uh, the solution of all these equations. Uh, for the current model, model uh, we follow a pretty much the same idea. We just change the system of differential equations. Uh, and then we look at a different configuration now in the cortical area. The cortical area is very different because the cortical neurons are very sparse. So there's not many neurons on the cortical area. Most of the uh, neurons are underneath the cortical area. So the most dense configuration we use it that the reason why we use the fused, fused Nagumo. And then for the Kura model, model we use the more sparse configuration. Uh, but you can see that in, in the first case that we use the Barabasi Albert distribution, that's a distribution showing power low back vertex distribution, which means a fractal distribution self uh, organization. 
uh, the synchronization of all the solutions are pretty uh, evident. Then when you move to another type of distribution uh, with the same number of nodes, which is pretty interesting, 36 nodes with power low and 36 nodes with the watt straw gas distribution, look at now the, the, the level of synchronization is not going to be as well as the one that we obtained for the first uh, case. Uh, we tested uh, that sort of configuration, and that configuration we tested because it was very typical when you have athlete with conclusion that uh, athlete get kind of uh, hit on the, in, the, in their head. So there's part of the brain that are getting disconnected. And that's one of the network use it very common for conclusion uh, in neuroscience. So you can see there that there's some oscillation that appears at the very low level, while there's always a, an oscillation that is skyrocketing over there, which is uh, very interesting from the point of view of what we did it. So then uh, we tested the Bernoulli distribution for the, for the graph with that sort of configuration, and we found that that configuration doesn't show kind of a, a very typical behavior on the brain. Uh, uh, an oscillation in amplitude, while the rest of the oscillations are uh, pretty much limited to certain amplitude that is controlled over time. Uh, finally, uh, the Cura motor model will solve it for 46 neurons highly interconnected. So the highly interconnected neurons is showing a perfect graph when you look at the oscillations. And that's an indication that the level of connectivity of the brain is very, uh, very important when you are addressing problems like epilepsy. So if you're changing the level of connectivity at the local scale, so that will immediately impact the response of the group of neurons. Uh, in conclusion, so both mathematical models for the dynamic of interacting neurons were solving showing sign of synchronization. Uh, the order parameter which quantified the strength of the synchronization wasn't calculated this time. Sensitivity to the strength of connectivity of networks appears as one of the most striking features. And the study was limited to synaptic connections that do not change over time. Strength of the connection remains constant. This limitation might miss the fact that synaptic connections either improve or deteriorate over time, leading to uh, central ner nervous system disorders. Uh, in this case, it was controlled by the connectivity. A comparison with the real epileptic brain networks obtained from EEG inverse signal processing is planned for the future. The result of that simulation was uh, published already in an uh, open science forum and, and is already a, a peer review with it. I included there the, the reference, and I'm very pleased to have my both students here that they conducted most of the simulation uh, results. That's it. Thank you.